Good afternoon or good morning, should I say, and uh, welcome to another Careers Conversation. I'm very pleased to welcome today Andrew Clark and John Brent, uh, who are both architects. And uh, rather than try and introduce them and go into technical details, I'm going to let Andrew and John introduce themselves and let, th let you know what they do. So let's start with Andrew, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Andrew Clark. I'm one of the directors of Canon Clark Architects. I'll just correct you, Helen. I'm not actually an architect. I'm a, I'm a chartered architectural technologist. Uh -huh. um, so I do indeed design buildings, um, but as you'll probably find out from John um, in a few moments, we had very different career paths. Um, mine was a very technical sort of background, but yeah, I'm sure we'll uh, touch base on that soon but yeah we I still design buildings okay all right so I got that bit wrong John are you an architect I, I indeed am yes hi yes Excellent. My, <laughs> yeah, my, my my career path was GCSEs A levels going to university for for a lower degree then doing a master's degree and then doing professional exams um, so I, I'm registered as, as an architect on my official architects register um, uh, you know, therefore, I've got sort of letters after my name to, to okay. prove. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're all official. Okay. Yeah. What A levels did you do, John? Just out of interest. Well, I did. I was advised my by my career teacher to do. Um, I, I did maths, physics, and art. Okay. Um, I mean, in hindsight, I don't know whether I would suggest that to to pupils. I don't know. Okay. That's still the advice. Um, yeah, that's that is still the advice largely, but I, the courses do vary depending on yeah. which institution. So, I mean, um, I, th I think there is a case of needing a bit of maths, but actually, yeah. it's, physics and maths is is very kind of more to do with the technical side. I I kind of think a humanity is quite good, a geography right. or history it might be for me. I, I would have thought that was more relevant okay. than the context of why what why we're building and where we're building. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, yeah because we, don't, we don't do a lot. We don't do a lot of sort of number crunching and calculations. That's more the sort of structural engineers. Okay, Andrew, did you do A levels? Did you uh, go to? Did, yeah, yeah, I did indeed. Yeah, so I I studied um, math, mathematics, um, maths with mechanics, so more right. on the physics side, and was very interested in art. So yeah, I did a, an A level in art um, in the general studies, and I yeah did music technology as well. Yeah. OK, so that's quite diverse as well. And so you did, uh, John, you did A-levels and went to university. Andrew, tell us what your route was. You said a, a different yeah, route so, altogether. Yeah, I, I then went off to university to do um, a foundation in architecture. And um, so I wasn't actually sure about what career path I wanted to take, but I knew I loved art. So I was, I was quite good at, you know, I had an interest in sort of maths and physics and more like social studies, um, that sort of thing. So I was a... Yeah, I loved interacting with people, and uh, but yeah, it wasn't 100% fixed on, on architecture. So I ended up studying architecture and diversified into a career in music. So um, okay, uh, and this probably leads on to why I um, sort of studied very hard post university, and um, yeah, I, I I completed my studies through distance learning university whilst working for architectural and surveying practices. Um, so yeah, a much longer route, but yes. um, yeah, we got okay. here in the end. <laughs> Absolutely. Can one of you explain for me the differences between architect and your job title, Andrew, which I hesitate to try and um, remember completely? Um, yeah, I mean, essentially the, the skill sets are, are very similar. Um, I mean, traditionally, the, the qualifications Andrew has would have would would be work would allow someone to say work for a, a practice of architects where the architects would do the, the fancy design and the and the arty bit and a technologist would then draw it draw up for the, the design in CAD and do more of a technical detailed okay. design for construction stuff. But actually it's a very much the crossover is if you're good with people and you're good at um, talking to clients and you've got a flair for the design it doesn't necessarily matter that you're not an architect. You can't call yourself an architect, but you do the same job. Yeah. And I think, you know, Andrew's got a, a, a technical bias, but that doesn't mean to say he's not a good designer or can't, you know, doesn't mind meeting with clients and liaising with clients. And, and the same, on the opposite side with John, who's a great designer, but can deliver an amazing technical package and, you know, work on pre and post contract works to, to actually deliver a building contract. 
so yeah, there's there's certainly um, yeah crossovers on, on on both disciplines. Okay, and both of you are mentioning their um, design and creative background and flair. What what led you to architecture from that? Was that were there any other avenues that you thought you could take your particular skills, or or was architecture always going to be it for you? So I go. Um, I, I think. I mean, I was. I always had an interest in art. I was always reasonably good at art, but I think yeah. I always. I knew from the outset that I was never going to be good enough to be a commercial artist or a, you know, uh, an illustrator. Um, but I also liked sort of problem solving, and and I think I I, I very much considered careers in product design or interior design something that you know the you, you the artistic flair enables you to have imagination to create something, but also there's a, a fair amount of sort of pragmatic problem solving. Um, you know, I guess product design was my first choice, but I, I realised that architecture was an easier career path for me. Okay. How about you, Andrew? Um, I, I just had a, a massive love for music and art. So um, not only listening to music, playing music, writing music. Um, I, yeah, I absolutely loved it. And I think the career's advice at the time was, you know, it's not great to have a career in music. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I gave it a go. And I'm still a, a musician, still yeah. dabble a little bit. But yeah, I think the folks in architecture is probably a better choice. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so um, if you can, if there is such a thing as a typical day, what, what does your typical work day look like? What will you be doing? Will you be in a studio? Will you be with people? Will the, what, what happens? Can you, are yeah, you able to tell me? At, at the moment, the um, studio based is, um, yeah, is, is on hold. So we, yeah. we've got an office that we normally work in as, as a design team, but at the moment we're predominantly working remotely, which you know, has its challenges. But yeah, we're, we're very much um, we very much work as a team. Um, as, as designers, we'll all have some input into um, some design. Uh, it's not just a case of one person running with it, but it is it's very much a yeah, team sport. We'll all, all be working together. Okay. And I think a sort of typical day might be um, I mean, it depends what stage of a project you're on, but I'd sort of I'd do a pretend day where you I, might be a number of projects you're working on. You might get up in the morning, you might go and visit, do an initial visit to a client that you haven't met before, have a look at their property, discuss what their requirements might be. Um, you might come back to the office um, and then do a very kind of sketchy hand sketch or using SketchUp kind of feasible feasibility study for that client. Just work out roughly how big their extension could be, or how how to rearrange their office, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, say in the afternoon, you might need to do some technical drawings because there's a project being constructed on a, a construction site, and they need technical drawings to be able to build. They you know they need a detail of a roof. You take that to site, give it to the contractor, and then you might go on site and sort of inspect the works and see what they have built, whether they've built it in accordance with your drawings. Um, and and then you might go back to the office and write a letter to the contractor telling him where he might not build things correctly or you know it, there's there's so many so many different aspects there's the sort of front end dealing with clients initial liaison there's the sort of creative first part there's the going into planning doing a set of planning drawings to submit because uh, most architecture projects need planning permission by law yeah um, and then there's the delivery side which is very much um getting the project priced by a number of contractors, choosing a contractor um, and then going to site and then making sure the works are, 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 are made, the quality of works is maintained. And that's why people use architects rather than just, here's your set of drawings, good luck, I hope it gets built okay. People to like to retain the architect to go and do inspections and, and look after the financial aspects of, of, of that as well. That might, be, that might be a misconception of, of what we do as as designers where you might think we're, we're just drawing um, constantly drawing but um yeah the delivery of, of a building project has you know lots of layers to it and um you might only be say physically drawing for 20 percent of that whole um that yeah, whole role from a building from start to to finish yeah as a homeowner the prospect of having uh, an architect come to my home and work with me on an idea I think I have but I don't really have is really exciting um, it's one of those things that um, 
I kind of know what I want. I have a concept of what I want in my home. I need someone to realise it for me. It, it, is that how it feels for you going into people's homes and working with them on projects? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think mo most clients perhaps have an idea of what they want just in general. They want a bigger kitchen. They want an open plan living dining space. Um, and, and you walk into a property and you can sort of size it up and think, actually, do what they want. Does it does it actually physically fit? Mm -hmm. Can you make it fit? And you can give them a bit of a steer. Um, some clients are very um, prescriptive. You know, they know exactly what they want. And, and we always say to them, you know, have you got an open mind? Because I'm sure, you know, there's other ways of doing it that we'd like to explore for you. And there might be a better way of doing it. OK, it's those it's those things that I always, you know, as a, as, a, as a client, I would want to hear. I think I know what I want, but I'm really open to the idea of somebody saying, have you thought about this? You know, if I yeah. if I watch programmes where I, I can see architects work, it's it's just mind blowing to me. And I wonder, is that the best bit of the job or is what, what is it you particularly enjoy about what you do? Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. John, like John, John mentioned earlier about you know these interest in problem solving. We we're yeah. effectively you know problem solvers. So like you mentioned with your example there, we would understand what what your constraints are, what what your brief is, what what's not working in your property at the moment, and really take the time to understand you know what those problems are. And we'd effectively help you develop and refine your brief. And that will enable us then to put some sketches together and, and very light touch exercises to you see what options are available to you know to come up with a solution an architectural solution should i say yeah. um, that's that's the exciting bit because and you know our, our clients are you know really pleased that you know we think oh, is this actually possible it looks great and that's the the exciting element i mean but the, the whole journey can be exciting um, and, it, and it's great to actually go back and see some clients you know say a year after the project's complete and see how the property's changed how the lives have improved through you know that consultation process and i think it is you know it's an ideal opportunity to design something that's entirely tailored to yourselves it's you're not buying something off plan it's yeah it's it's bespoke um, it fits your individual requirements so that is you know it's a really exciting part of the part of um what we do yeah okay so it's been it's, been, it's the sort of enjoyment is the, the certain milestones you know actually getting planning permission for in some areas and for some clients might be quite tricky because it's yeah. quite controversial but that's a when you get planning permission that's a fantastic moment yeah. I think when you start on site, it's all very optimistic. It's a fantastic moment. There's bits during the build where you've, you, you've, got, you've got a mental image of what you've designed, but you know you can't really fully visualise it. Even though you see it coming together. That's yeah, even, really even nice. though software is pretty good nowadays, actually seeing what it really looks like and think, oh, I designed that and it actually looks okay. And then at the end, just, you know, hopefully happy clients, a smile on their faces when they've when the project's complete. Have have the has the um, plethora of programmes on national TV about redesigning your home, visualising your garden, using 3D software and all that thing, yeah. has, that, has that been good for you in, as an industry or is it a, a bit of a bugbear? It, it has a, advantages and disadvantages. I mean, it shows what we, we can deliver, but sometimes, um, sometimes issues might be dramatised for the purpose of TV, you know, particularly thing, things like grand designs, um, where you'll see a, a client start a project with, say, a, a budget of half a million pounds, and by the end of the programme, they've finished spending a million pounds. The reality is we wouldn't be doing our jobs properly if we let a contract um, operate like that. So the, the yeah misconception from clients is that whatever a contract sum is, sometimes it's going to vary massively. But yeah, it the would, mechanism would be interesting TV if it went, went right, would it? Yeah, it's great TV, but yeah, for, for us, we, we need to give the assurances that we'll effectively manage a contract to deliver those works to a contract sum. And anything that varies in cost is normally an unforeseen item, such as you know, things underground that you couldn't possibly see, you know, contract has a you know uh, a valuation in there for those works because it not accounted for it or the sheet not accounted for it, whoever it might be. But yeah, um, it, and unless the client changes their mind, post contract as well, that doesn't help. But you know, if, if the design is well considered at the early stages, there shouldn't be really any reason to uh, to change their minds. But yeah, that's I, I think for me, I'm not sure what you think, John, but that is yeah, it's yeah. probably the most frustrating thing about. I, I, th I think I think the really good thing about those programs is it's brought 
design and architecture into it, more into the public domain, public Absolutely. awareness. And it shows that you don't have to be super rich or or super connected to be able to in, engage the services of an architect. You know, it's fairly normal people, everyday people using um, architects and, and garden designers. I mean, there are moments where you kind of want to switch the TV off and leave the room because you're kind of <laughs> shouting, at, you know, why the hell did you, sorry, excuse my French, why, <laughs> why, why, did you, why on earth did you design it like that? It should have been, yeah. you know, you could have done this or or clients making decisions and you think, oh, you know, that, that was the wrong decision. But apart from yeah. that, I think, I mean, generally, I think it's good. It's, it's about public awareness of, of, yeah. of actually, um, you know, there is something more than just standard yeah. um, house design. There's, there's, there's a quality of design that you know an architect can bring to a project yeah and in conjunction with that the fact that um we're in we're still in a global pandemic and everybody's been spending a lot more time at home has that been a boost for your industry or are you are people hanging on to their money how, how has it affected what your day-to-day -day business good one <laughs> <laughs> are you still waiting to find out <laughs> Yeah, it's been, the work's, work's been affected, um, you know, different projects. Um, yeah, I think, that, you know, obviously people's savings have probably increased and in certain types of, of, of the market. Yeah. Um, but, you know, where one market has suffered, another might have improved. So say the, 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 the decline in, uh, you know, the occupation of office spaces could lead to, you know the possible change of use of those office spaces into say residential so there are markets that open up and you know that's that's quite exciting so bringing buildings and um, that were currently underutilized into you know a meaningful use so yeah there's exciting elements there yeah conscious well, we've had quite a few, the question <laughs> yeah we've had quite a few inquiries for people who want to extend their house because they want a home office i guess yeah. that's the direct <laughs> yeah but i guess all, all those home offices we're designing are office buildings in the town centers we're not designing yeah, yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? There's swing, swings and roundabouts and there's a lot to be decided as people return to work and yeah. how that will work. I know people like Aviva have given up huge office spaces on business parks mm. already. And so, it, it, yes, it will change, but opportunities all around each corner. We've talked about the good bits. Um, what are the bad bits? What, what, what are the downsides, the challenges, the things that really annoy you about your job? Is there anything? Yes, lots. <laughs> <laughs> I must say it's, it's outweighed by the good bits. Otherwise, you know, I good. guess we would change careers. Yeah. Um, the, the bad bits is when you don't get planning permission, you think it's totally reasonable what you've proposed and the client's very happy. And for some reason, you don't get planning permission. Or if a, a, if a contract starts to go wrong um, and, uh, you know, the builder perhaps hasn't looked at the drawings properly and just decides to build what they want to build rather than the drawings and you've got to police that and it gets can get quite confrontational because it's time and money and you know they've got to rebuild it it's going to cost them twice as much um and that can get that can get frustrating quite quite <laughs> there's, uh, some, yeah. there's some robust conversations there yeah anyway. yeah <laughs> i love that term some robust conversations well, I suppose we're there to have a robust conversation because on the path of the clients so the client doesn't have to kind of get too involved with having arguments with a contractor um you know that's the point of our, our service in that regard um, but you know, building contracts usually go right, but they can go wrong, and 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 when they go wrong, it, it can be quite painful. But we're there to to protect the client, to make yeah. sure that if it does go wrong, we try and turn it around and make it get it back on track or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Is that how you feel, Andrew? You feel much the same that there's a frustration. Yeah. yeah, frustrations with yeah poor planning decisions and. Um, yeah, protecting um, our clients' interests on, on site. One, you know, with you know, yeah, like I say, with contracts goes slightly south. We, we, yeah, we're there to pick up the pieces, but there's a lot of administration uh, behind the scenes, and it yeah it has its challenges. But you know, I'd, I'd still say there's 99% of the job that I absolutely love there. Um, it's pretty yeah, good. It's pretty good. <laughs> just sometimes it's more probably more frustrating than. Um, yeah, yeah, saying it, it is, yeah, there's frustrating elements, but it's still a, a great, a great job. Okay, so if you were to um, whiz yourself back to 18 years old, 16 years old, or whatever, 
would you would you pursue this path again if you were a young person now who had vague creative ideas or was a good designer would you recommend this path and, and what advice would you give to someone who wants to do so oh shall i go first yeah yeah um, i'd i'd probably still pick the, the same career path i'd probably I mean, for, for me in particular, I probably wouldn't have done the university thing. I might have looked at what, what is available at the moment, like um, university level apprenticeships. Yeah. So as myself, not being massively academic um, and, and very, very creative, I'm very capable of what I'm doing. But I, th I think that the university thing might not have worked so well for me, um, but very much value, you know, the yeah degrees and, and what they do uh, but I'd, I'd probably look to do yeah a vocational path from the start and um, yeah what about yourself John? Oh absolutely yeah I, I, I absolutely would do the same thing again um, uh, I, I guess I'm gonna sit on the other side of the fence and advocate of a, a, an academic route because um, it's you know it's it, a horses to courses yeah for courses um, yeah, I, I very much enjoyed the university experience. You know, you go to university to, to, in my case, to do a vocational degree rather than just a sort of general degree. So I kind of always knew that it was heading towards the path of being an architect. But I think the thing about university was that you're just mixing with like-minded people. Yeah. Um, there's a social aspect of it. Um, it's just the kind of the wealth of knowledge you accumulate at university isn't just specific to your course. It's just being around people who are doing all different walks of life, doing all different sorts of subjects, and just generally enjoying sort of three or four years of your life where if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to get a client suing you for, for a mistake. Um, Actually, Helen, I'm going to change my answer now because um, I forgot about the social aspects of university. It was amazing, by the way. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with John on that one again now. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's so it's, long ago. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? I'm I I think that um, there's so much more choice, I think, for young people now, and more availability of different courses. What I always try and tell my pupils is to think about what feels right for them. If they're not a great socialiser, and that element is not. Uh, important to them is university the right thing do you want to be earning straight away do you want to you know qualify quicker than your graduate counterparts an apprenticeship might be uh, a good option so I think the two sides you've given there very very well you know the, there's advantages and disadvantages of both so it's about the individual and what feels right for them um, is there anything on the horizon or any um, anything that's trendy at the moment that budding architects could be thinking about. I'm thinking, for example, of um, the emphasis uh, and, and the understanding that young people have about climate change. Is there a move towards sort of carbon neutral buildings, uh, uh, green spaces, something like that? Is, is that something worth thinking about? I mean, yeah, I mean, generally, I think the industry has adapted and, um, you know, in terms of choosing um, building materials and mechanical electrical systems are all a, a lot better than they, they used to be um, and have sustainable credentials. I mean, what the, we, there, was a t there was a target to have carbon neutral uh, houses for, was it 2030? Yeah. But, then the, but the, that, that was made an act of law, but then the, the government repealed it. <clears throat> so there's no, yeah, <laughs> which is a bit of a shame. Because um, I think if we if it had been law, um, the industry would have adapted quicker. I think it's just yeah. allowed the industry to take their foot off the pedal a bit. But I mean, it's, it's in the back of our minds about um, sustainability. And actually, <clears throat> you know, I think there's nothing more sustainable than reusing an existing building and upgrading it because the actual carbon, embodied carbon in in refurbing a building and adapting it rather than having to start again is a lot more. So, you know, it might be fantastic you're designing um you know sustain, uh, renewable energy sources um but actually if you don't have to make something again from scratch you are you know and that's really good for city centers where there's lots of buildings out there that could be reused or people adapt their houses by extensions and conversions rather than starting again yeah yeah okay andrew anything that comes to mind any trends that you would want students to be aware of or um 
trends. Uh, no, I, do you know, uh, from from a student perspective, if I, I'd probably just suggest ra sort of rather than trends, just uh, we see a lot of um, you know potential candidates for the university for architecture that don't know a huge amount about architecture and, and right. you know, what architects are. And I'd say rather than trends, just look at you know some some of the famous architects, the, the movers out there, and just see what they were designing. You know, say a hundred years ago, so people like Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and um, just amazing architects, and um, and just sort of go back to the the beginnings. Okay. And yeah, good advice. Good advice. What do you want to see in a young person when they come to you? Um, do you want do you expect them to have a portfolio, loads of work experience? What anything particularly or? Good, good question. <laughs> Your point to first. Um, for, for, for me, I, I'd, I'd like to see a, a willingness to learn and adapt, and just to really, really listen. Um, not only to not only to us to help guide their careers, but um, from a client's perspective, and you're not to be driven by ego. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah my own perspective. Um, John. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the willingness to learn and the sort of um, the appetite for wanting to people to push themselves to to bet you know to do better and better themselves. Um, I quite like seeing candidates that um, you know uh, graphically they're able to to do really simple diagrams or little illustrations or you know that that can convey an idea. It's all about the the graphical communication, the communication of an idea, and for us that's. You know, but it's the turnover of how quickly we can do that. Obviously, is our is our what allows us to be to su survive in business. Yeah, we, so, we don't want, we don't want to see that start and then just a finished product. It's the strategic moves between, and, yeah. and if you can demonstrate those and tell the story, mm -hmm. um, that's you know real advantage. Okay. It's great advice. Great advice. I'm aware that I've kept you talking for a long time, chat. So one final question to you both: Are there any burning ambitions within architecture or outside of architecture that you have you know do you where do you see yourself in five ten twenty years time retired <laughs> I'll, I'll see you there course. John <laughs> <laughs> um I think I mean I've, I've, I've Canon Clark has, has been in existence for for five years I, I spent a lot of my time in London working for quite big practices and I did some fantastic buildings I was part of the Olympics did stuff on Regent Street yeah. so there's some fantastic buildings I, I, I know I've been involved in so I haven't really um, I don't feel the need to have to build the new Wembley Stadium or the new Houses of Parliament but I would love to do some reasonably significant building in Norwich I think but Norwich is crying out for a really good city centre building designed by a practice that's uh, like ours not rather than the established practices that have been there for forever um, there is some fantastic opportunities and I think we'd, we'd really love to, well I'd really love to get my teeth into something yeah, significant for, for our city. Yeah, great. Andrew? Yeah, well long long term for us as practice, as John said, we, you know, we're, we've only been trading for five years, but we've you know, got some big ambitions. And I think just to build on the team that we've got, the you know, our people that really do care about architecture and the environment and really listening, I think just to continue to create some really great buildings um, and with care, so that we really do care about what we do. I think that's, if we keep doing that and building our team, I think my ambition is just to, you know, grow as a practice and just do what we do on just a slightly bigger scale. I think I think you hit the nail on the head there, really, in terms of developing people, Andrew. We got an apprentice who got, you know, second year at university. Um, is one of our, one of our members of staff, and we've got people who've just graduated, and, and to see them develop and to become fully formed, capable architects. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, at, at the point at which Andrew and I might retire, but you know, the practice carries on that you've got yeah. capable people delivering great quality architecture when we're gone. Hopefully. Chaps, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time and I realise I have kept you talking. For, That's no problem. I could keep, I could keep going because it's so comprehensive and so interesting for our people. So on behalf of the entire community and all our budding architects, of which we have many, thank you very much for your time. Thank Great. you. Thank, thank you. you. And good luck to everyone. Best wishes for everyone's career. Thanks okay. very much, guys. No problem. Thank you.